Uh, my name is Sean Goggins. I'm a professor at the University of Missouri, and I'm working with the Chaos Project now. I'm on the Chaos Board, which basically means I get to vote on things every now and then. And I'm here to present two things, really, chaos, sort of an update on each of the five working groups that we have right now, and through the lens of the software that we've built in my lab to prototype some of the chaos metrics called Augur. And there we go. So chaos, and how many of you have not heard of chaos? Has anyone not heard of chaos? Okay, welcome. Hey. I'm from chaos. Sorry. <laughs> and it's not, a, it's not the um, insurance commercial in the United States version of chaos. It's actually a, an a work, working group inside the Linux Foundation trying to understand open source project health from various different perspectives. So building a common understanding is what we're about. And the first mission that we have are implementation agnostic metrics. And what that means is regardless of how you store your software, whether it's in GitHub or another Git repository, or even if you're using SVN, you know, if you're, you're very old school, you, we can, these metrics will be relevant for your organization. And then to produce integrated open source software for analyzing the development of these metrics. So Grimoire Lab is the main commercial, sort of robust, supported software. And then Augur is a package that we use to prototype a lot of the metrics. We can move faster because we don't really have customers. So if we break things, you know, but we try not to. Uh, these are, this is an example of some of the organizations that are part of this open community that's working on chaos. Like I said, we have the two metrics. We've got like metrics categories and software, so we're doing both. And the metrics fall into five working groups now. Some of you may have heard of growth maturity and decline, and we used to call it that, but now we call it evolution. And Jesus, who gave our keynote, and I have contributed a lot to that working group. There's also a working group on diversity and inclusion that has been less focused on defining metrics and more focused on sort of framing out the challenge of diversity in open source software and developing processes and tools to help mitigate that. And then risk, value, and common are the other three working groups. You look like you're gonna take a picture, so I didn't wanna like change the slides because I was back there taking pictures earlier. Just get my camera up and the slide would move. Um, so evolution, just to give you an idea what evolution looks like. We have a metric in Augur that will look at the 109, for example, Twitter repositories on GitHub right now, and then identify the repos that had the most average by commits or lines of code in a given year. And so these are the 10 most active Twitter open source repositories on GitHub from the last year. We also can give you a visualization of lines of code added by authors, so this is the Thrift client. And I chose this one as an example because when you talk about evolution, you can see that this repository has a lot of contributions back in 2010 through mid-2011, a bounce of activity in 2013 and again in 2014, and then it's kind of fallow until late 2017, early 2018. That's an example, I think, of what uh, another speaker talked about earlier. I think it was you, Giuseppe, who talked about repositories that get dead, which I love the titles of your slides. Um, reasons to be dead, or what was it? Why? Way to developer take backs. Yeah, way to die, ways to die, or why to die, or something. Why they die, and then why they're resurrected. So it's very, uh, <coughs> very thought-provoking slide titles I really enjoyed. And so this is an example of one that I think went through a period of foulness and then kind of came back to life a little bit. We can also, so one thing to point out is we have, this comes straight from the Git repository, so we actually clone the Git repository and count all the code. And then for issues, we have some implementations that look at the GH torrent database for GitHub clients and show you just like the issue volume. And you can see the issue volume kind of falls to zero and maintains about zero in the last issues in 2013 on this repository. And when we're designing metrics in, in Augur, we have three core design principles. One is transparency, this is so that you can see through the metric to the chaos definition and understand where that metric comes from. The second is comparison. So the reason we use GHTorrent is so if you don't have to clone every single repository on GitHub in order to compare your work and your repository with something else. And finally, easy modification and access. So we have an API that's structured by repos and repo groups. Repo groups are simply collections of repositories that you say you want to look at together as a set 
a lot of projects have more than one repository that they rely on, and so this is this is one way that Augur organizes them. So what I wanted to point out is that now Augur's integrated data from GitHub, Git, Git repositories, mining, um, email lists, and other kinds of inputs so that everything is integrated inside one data model, which supports the Ease of, ease of extension and ease of developing new metrics. So as we go forward, new APIs are simple to build. You can see just by example, you have this repository table and a repository group table and a set of examples for how to go through them. And then over here we have issues and issue events and people who contribute issues and the labels that go on them. This comes from GitHub. This comes directly from the Git repository itself. So when we're putting together metrics and we're trying to look across an ecosystem, the data comes from a lot of different places. And so we're trying to provide an example of, of how that works in, in the uh, evolution working group. For diversity and inclusion, I wanted to highlight just one aspect of what they're doing right now. Here's their mission, which is to look at the ethical peer-validated research and form set of standards for measuring diversity and inclusion in open source. And then their objective four for this year is looking at the ethical guidelines that people follow before they're allowed to use the brand chaos DNI metrics, so crowdsourced and prioritized them, documented the best practices, evaluated solutions, and so the, the DNI working group takes very seriously the responsibility to the community of not just throwing a label or a brand out there to say that we're DNI compliant with chaos. That they want they want the practices that they've really worked hard to define in partnership with Mozilla and the Linux Foundation and other stakeholders. To, to let that be meaningful and to help people adapt the practices that are used in open source to build a more authentically diverse community. The two working groups that I'm most active in right now are risk and value. And so all chaos working groups have um, <clears throat> a set of uh, sort of a category and then a focus area. And then within each focus area, there are questions. So it's kind of a goal, manage risk, a question, under the focus area and then a metric. So under for each metric that we develop, there's a set of questions that that metric is answering. And the five focus areas in risk right now are security, code quality, and you'll see some similarity between the risk categories and the evolution categories. Licensing, business risk, and transparency. So each of these addresses different dimensions of risk and how different kinds of organizations on the production side and the consumption side of open source software might view things. Uh, consuming organizations are concerned a lot with how do I know if a project has quality? How do I know if there's a community behind it? So when a hospital or other industry that's not in the business of producing open source software wants to decide on which open source software they can consume, these risk metrics become very important because managers are trying to assess risk inside of an organization and the, the first question they have is, is there a community that supports this and how do I know that that community is more robust than another one. And then over on value, we're starting to look at questions that relate to different perspectives on how things are valued. The first is labor investment. So there are two, there's a model called Kokomo, which many of you are probably familiar with, for estimating the labor investment in software and the complexity of different packages of software. If you've ever applied some of the modern um, applications of Kokomo, you know that it can be a little touchy. Um, but trying to look at labor investment and comparative labor investment inside of your ecosystem and giving people tools to do that. Innovation value is something that we have less specific metrics defined around right now. Downstream value is something and ecosystem value are both um, focus areas that look at the dependency chains that exist. So are you familiar with libraries.io as, as a resource? So looking at what libraries are inside which repositories, the mappings often 50 or more libraries come from a single repository. And who is consuming or depending on these libraries downstream and what do these libraries depend on or what does, a, what does your software depend on? So looking at that life cycle chain. And then um, again like innovation, living wage is a kind of ambitious focus area that we don't have a lot of definition around right now. But this, this gives you a general idea of the focus of risk and value. And to give you a little bit more um, of an idea how value metrics might work, lines of, we could take a look at the lines of code in any repository. There are numerous code counters out there. And so I just took the top end, you can see it's all alphabetized, 
of a list of 6,800 repositories as an example. And you can see that arrow of the year um, in this list has by far the most lines of code closing in at nearly 160,000. So lines of code are lines of code. Every repository also has documentation these days, right? So a lot of times there's a lot of markdown in a repository. So what are the total lines in a project? And you can see here that it closes in on 200,000 when you look at Barrow here, and, or 2 million, excuse me, and then Ansible is close to a, uh, 20 million. 20 million, yeah, so it is. And then Ansible is close to 5 million. And if I look over here, Ansible is about 4 million. And, and so you can see the number of lines of things that are not code increases. And that's, that's not necessarily a linear representation of value, but it's one high-level way that you can look at the girth of a project very easily. And then complexity using a, a co uh, an implementation of Kokomo, we can look at the complexity. And not surprisingly, as the size of the project grows, the complexity is measured as a bit higher. And there are some projects that have low complexity. And complexity can be useful for a lot of purposes when, when you're trying to estimate the cost of building something, understanding complexity and sort of um, tuning it to what you know about a project is helpful. So in this example, we go, yeah, yeah, this happened. Right, boom. So in this example, we just take lines of code times complexity to estimate the number of hours. Now it's a very oversimplified algorithm, but I'm just doing it for illustration. If you were using it on projects that you're familiar with, you would use some kind. You would use a more sophisticated Kokomo implementation. Um, then you can see that you know by complexity times lines of code, you can get kind of an estimate number of hours. And you can see arrow gear here, um, essentially with a high complexity and a, a high number of lines of code, the hours skew up. So I would be skeptical of that and go look into what is complex inside that package. Um, and then if you can take that and say, let's say we do hours, um, which is lines of code times complexity times $50 an hour, you can get an approximate estimate of what it might cost to rebuild um, software. Now, I wouldn't take any of this out of the box because when I ran it against Augur, it said it would cost me $9 million to rebuild it. I'm pretty sure I haven't spent anywhere near that um, on it. And, and when you look in, if you know a project, you can look into anything that's on the web and see that a lot of times they incorporate, for example, JavaScript libraries, and those tend to look very complex, but it's nothing that you've written. So value metrics give you something that you can start to get your head around and tune um, to your own devices. And then if I want to just take a look at one project and what, so what is in the three scale project? Okay, I've got a half a million lines of JSON. That might not even be code, right? That might be something else. Ruby, JavaScript, PHP, you can get a breakdown very easily of how much of what kind of software is in each of these projects, which can also be helpful for assessing the value of the project in your ecosystem. Risk, so jumping to risk. <laughs> Sorry, create a visual transition for you post-lunch. Um, risk is, like I said, we have five main focus areas, security, code quality, licensing, transparency, and business risk. Each of these has a set of metrics that we've defined. So CI best practicing badges we already have inside of Augur. Um, how many people are familiar with the CI best practice badging program? Okay, a few of you. So if you go to the link, if you Google Linux Foundation CII badge, you'll find a basically a questionnaire that you can go through for a repository that you own that you own. And it's looking at things that are really closely aligned with measure, process measures of software quality. So what is your test coverage is a question. And then you're asked to provide some evidence of that test coverage. And so these questionnaire driven representations of quality from a process mostly perspective are used to provide, I think, gold, silver, and bronze statuses of being CII badged. And it, essentially the, the line of rigor goes up as you go up to gold. And there's a few gold projects, the Zephyr project among them. And so for any project that's been badged, we gather its temporal progress through the badging program. So anytime, if, you're, if we put a repo in Augur, and it's badged, once a month we'll go we'll get its badging status. And basically the answer is to all of the 261 questions on the questionnaire. And I don't think it's that many questions, I think it's more like that much pieces of discrete data. 
and, and keep, it track of that, keep track of that, which can be useful. Um, programming language analysis, I just showed you that. Code complexity, kind of showed you that. So you can see some of the things that we would use for risk are also useful in the value and evolution areas, right? Because code complexity, um, if it's more complex, some people might judge it to be more, more brittle. Um, but again, you have to apply the context for a project to what you find out. We, Augur and Grimoire Lab, we can give you statistics. And those statistics, I think, are useful. But and outside of the context of projects that you know, chaos metrics have less utility. Test coverage has come up a lot recently. How many people have used test coverage to assess open source projects? Or how many branches of a test, how, much, how many branches of your code are tested? So this comes directly from consuming organizations primarily. People who work for corporations that want to buy software are really keenly interested in understanding how much of that software goes through a software unit test or regression test on a regular basis. They, those are questions that are being asked. And so some of the risk metrics are coming directly from what consumers of open source software are, are asking for. And then in GitHub, we have this idea that in some projects you can have a process in place where a pull request can't be accepted by one person, where it has to be reviewed by multiple people and you can't merge your own pull request. GitHub lets you do that now. And we think that if a project or a repository has it in place, it's likely at least some kind of vague process signal that they're focused on ensuring that at least nefarious code isn't accidentally committed without oversight. And that, of course, probably knows has happened. From a licensing perspective, um, Software bill of materials, is, this is also something that's being asked for by consumers of open source software. And we're using DUSAX and some other um, Linux Foundation tools to actually scan each file looking for a license declaration. Um, and then, of course, in GitHub and most Git repositories, you can have license declarations at the repository level. But as, as many of you know, file level declarations is what we're kind of looking for. Any questions? I mean, I've been bad, you know, talking. Go on for later. Okay, all right. Go on for later, save it up. Um, and then transparency, again, you know, knowing what is in a package when you deploy it and knowing the origins of that code is important. That's another software bill of materials question. And then business risks. We already have a lot of the code measures that people would be looking for when it comes to business risk. And issues are, this is interesting because issue resolution time may mean something for one project and might mean less for another. Issue um, is, yeah, resolution time might have different meanings, and the volume of issues might mean different things to, on different projects. And because tagging of issues is not standardized, right now we're simply accumulating a set of tags that are used on all the GitHub issues and the repositories that we track on Augur and trying to arrive at some kind of a map thesaurus of things that mean bug. So there are many different words that different Git repositories use to mean bug. Many of them it's just bug, but others are more sort of possible defect or sort of vaguely leaning towards bug, but they don't want to use a word that would hurt your feelings as much, right? So building this thesaurus of, of words for defects, um, my mother would say Sean is a word for defect. <laughs> Again, just trying to keep you awake. Um, all right. Um, and then finally, elephant factor and bus factor, which are already included um, in the Augur API. Elephant factor being how many organizations are engaged in a project, and uh, bus factor being how many critical individuals are engaged in a project. If I'm trying to evaluate how robust a community is, if it's got a bus factor of two, I'm worried. If it's got an elephant factor of less than two, I'm worried. Less than three, I'm gets to three, I may be feeling a little bit better because there's at least three organizations contributing to it. But that's, again, a subjective judgment. And if I'm on the consumer side, I'm probably looking for, like, more is better. Like, the more organizations that are part of this work, the, the safer I feel. So higher numbers are uniformly better. And it's depending on the niche that you're in. Uh, and like I said this morning, Kubernetes is, like, an example, like an outlier. It's, there's probably a thousand or more organizations involved there. Most projects don't rise to that scale. Complexity is also a factor in risk, and then just here again are the complexity scores to just sort of refocus you and help you see that some of these metrics or some of the things that we can measure can be represented 
in different ways for different focus areas and different groups. So it might be the same underlying data represented in a slightly different fashion. Um, so why are we focusing on risk and value right now? You know, what's the what's behind Chaos's focus on that? Well, well, first, I think evolution and diversity and inclusion have really done a lot of work. There's a lot of, of representation of the evolution metrics inside of Grimoire Lab and Augur already. And so the chaos definitions for those kinds of concerns are, are more mature. And yeah, um, five? Five to 25 minutes. Really? Oh, wow. I'm sorry, I talk this long. Usually, you know? usually I don't like suck the air or like that. OK, so um, we want to start to understand composite metrics that signal and, and how they can relate to action. So risk and value are less straightforward evaluations than activity, which is a lot of what evolution looks at. And so one, thing, one reason we're focused over here right now is because these two work groups are looking at much more complex questions. And then we want to provide insights as local interpretations are done on the metrics. So like I mentioned, your context, your projects, this is, this is, you can't just take the numbers and have those numbers mean something. And by having a number of repositories and organizations in the source community using Augur, we're able to provide guideposts for what others have done in similar contexts. So we can look at you know, how different folks who use Augur who are willing to share their information allow us to sort of assess you know, red, blue, and green in their organization. And then those guidelines can be applied to similar projects. So it's part of it is data collection. And then finally, we want to develop an understanding of the processes that are based on facts. That's, that's why we're, we're focused on this. So we don't want to just say something has value because it has this number of lines of code, or this complexity, or has been around for this long. We want to say that something has value based on not only the statistics that we gather, but how organizations value that on the consuming side and the producing side of, of the metrics. And then finally, I'll talk about the common working group because we, we struggled to name this working group. Um, but it's, it's essentially really what we're focusing on here, and I, I don't know if I did this sort of cleverly or not. We have contributors. I, have, I contribute under outdoors at acm.org, or gogginss at missouri.edu, or s at goggins.com, or sean.goggins at gmail.com. I have like 12 email addresses that I have committed to GitHub to at various points in time. And this is an ongoing challenge in open source. We also have regulatory issues like the GDPR. California has a similar regulation in the United States that's coming up that pertain to privacy. So right now, there isn't an exchange of this information. And the common group is really focused right now on identifying individuals who are actual real people and the different email aliases that they use. Right now, if you can do this with Augur if you manage the list of aliases yourself. You can do it with Grimoire Lab using Sorting Hat. Uh, again, that has to be under your direct control, though, because of the, the regulations. So we're looking for ways, and one of the ways that we're exploring is the, um, the Linux Foundation's blockchain technology, Indy. The uh, Linux Foundation blockchain, anyone? Hyperledger. Hyperledger. Hyperledger Indy okay. is uh, focused on an anonymized ledger that, that can be used for managing identity. That's what the Indie project is all about. So that's one of the spaces that the common group is exploring. And then, of course, when you have these contributors, you also want to know whom they work for, what was the sponsor of their time, in a sense. And, and so the common group is really focused on this central, narrow, and significant question for open source software. And that's why we, one of the reasons we created a separate working group for it, because it touches all of the working groups. My slides are shared so you can see the different groups that are inside of Chaos right now. This is where our code is. We have weekly and monthly calls. All of the working groups meet at least every other week, and that information is available on our website. If you haven't signed up for our, new, our, our email list, Matt Germanfrey has taken on the mantle of creating a weekly update for all of the working groups in a summarized fashion so that you don't have to read 11 emails a week from the chaos group that are pointing you to Google Docs for minutes. So Matt's really kind of taken the lead of making sure that we're easier to follow and understand. We're a growing community and we hope that the people in this room are interested in the work that we do and will contribute to it through participation in these working groups. I'm done, I think. Oh, look, here we go.